Chapter 12 of Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Horton. Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic by Thomas Higginson. Chapter 12 The Voyage of St. Brandon. The young student Brandon was awakened in the morning by the crowing of the cock in the great Irish abbey where he dwelt. He rose, washed his face and hands, and dressed himself, then passed into the chapel where he prayed and sang until the dawn of the day. With song comes courage was the motto of the abbey. It was one of those institutions like great colonies, church, library, farm, workshop, college all in one of which ireland in the sixth century was full and which existed also elsewhere their extent is best seen by the modern traveller in the remains of the vast buildings at tintern in england scattered over a wide extent of country where you keep coming upon walls and fragments of buildings which once formed a part of a single great institution in which all the life of the community was organized, as was the case in the Spanish missions of California. At the Abbey of Bangor in Wales, for instance, there were 2,400 men, all under the direction of a comparatively small body of monks, who were trained to an amount of organizing skill like that now needed for a great railway system. Some of these men were occupied in various mechanic arts, some in mining, but most of them in agriculture, which they carried on with their own hands, without the aid of animals, and in total silence. Having thus labored in the fields until noonday, Brandon then returned that he might work in the library, transcribing ancient manuscripts or illustrating books of prayer. Having to observe silence, he wrote the name of the book to give to the librarian, and if it were a Christian work, he stretched out his hand, making motions with his fingers, as if turning over the leaves. But if it were a pagan author, the monk who asked for it was required to scratch his ear as a dog does, to show his contempt, because the regulation said an unbeliever might well be compared to that animal. Taking the book, he copied it, in the scriptorium or library or took it to his cell where he wrote all winter without a fire it is to such monks that we owe all our knowledge of the earliest history of england and ireland though doubtless the hand that wrote the histories of gildas and bede grew as tired as that of brandon or as that of the monk who wrote in the corner of a beautiful manuscript he who does not know how to write imagines it to be no labor, but though only three fingers hold the pen, the whole body grows weary. In the same way, Brandon may have learned music and have had an organ in his monastery or have had a school of art, painting beautiful miniatures for the holy missals. This was his early life in the convent once a day they were called for food this consisting for them of bread and vegetables with no seasoning but salt although better fare was furnished for the sick and the aged for travellers and the poor these last numbered at easter time some three or four hundred who constantly came and went and upon whom the monks and young disciples waited after the meal the monks spent three hours in the chapel on their knees still silent. Then they confessed in turn to the abbot, and then sought their hard-earned rest. They held all things in common. No one even received a gift for himself. War never reached them. It was the rarest thing for an armed party to molest their composure. Their domains were regarded as a haven for the stormy world, because there were so many such places in Ireland it was known as the Isle of Saints. Brandon was sent after a time to other abbeys where he could pursue especial studies, for they had six branches of learning, grammar, rhetoric, dialectics, geometry, 
astronomy, and music. Thus he passed three years, and was then advised to go to an especial teacher in the mountains, who had particular modes of teaching certain branches. But this priest, he was an Italian, was suffering from poverty, and could receive his guests but for a few weeks. One day as Brandon sat studying, he saw, the legend says, a white mouse come from a crack in the wall, a visitor which climbed upon his table and left there a grain of wheat. Then the mouse paused, looked at the student, then ran about the table, went away and reappeared with another grain, and another, up to five. Brandon, who had at the very instant learned his lesson, rose from his seat, followed the mouse, and looking through a hole in the wall, saw a great pile of wheat stored in a concealed apartment. On his showing this to the head of the convent, it was pronounced a miracle. The food was distributed to the poor, and the people blessed his charity while the Lord blessed his studies. In the course of years, Brandon became himself the head of one of the great abbeys, that of Clonfort, of the Order of St. Benedict, where he had under him nearly three thousand monks. In this abbey, having one day given hospitality to a monk named Berinthus, who had just returned from an ocean voyage, Brandon learned from him the existence far off in the ocean of an island called the Delicious Isle, to which a priest named Murnoch had retired with many companions of his order. Berinthus found Murnoch and the other monks living apart from one another for purposes of prayer. But when they came together, Murnoch said, they were like bees from different beehives. They met for their food and for church. Their food included only apples, nuts, and various herbs. One day Murnoch said to Berinthus, I will conduct you to the promised Isle of the Saints. So they went on board a little ship, and sailed westward through a thick fog until a great light shone, and they found themselves near an island which was large and fruitful and bore many apples. There were no herbs without blossoms, he said, nor trees without fruits, and there were precious stones, and the island was traversed by a great river. Then they met a man of shining aspect, who told them that they had, without knowing it, passed a year already in the island, that they had needed neither food nor sleep. Then they returned to the delicious island, and everyone knew where they had been by the perfume of their garments. This was the story of Berinthus, and from this time forward nothing could keep Brandon from the purpose of beholding for himself these blessed islands. Before carrying out his plans, however, he went, about the year 560, to visit an abbot named Enda, who lived at Aram, then called Isle of the Saints, a priest who was supposed to know more than anyone concerning the farther lands of the western sea. He knew, for instance, of the enchanted island named High Presail, which could be seen from the coast of Ireland only once in seven years and which the priests had vainly tried to disenchant. Some islands, it was believed, had been already disenchanted by throwing on them a few sparks of lighted turf, but as High Presail was too far for this, there were repeated efforts to disenchant it by shooting fiery arrows towards it, though this had not yet been successful. Then Enda could tell of wonderful ways to cross the sea without a boat, how his sister Fanchia had done it by spreading her own cloak upon the waves, and how she and three other nuns were borne upon it. She found, however, that one hem of the cloak sank below the water, because one of her companions had brought with her, against orders, a brazen vessel from the convent, but on her throwing it away, the sinking hem rose to the level of the rest and bore them safely. St. Enda himself had first crossed to Aaron on a large stone which he had ordered his followers to place on the water and which floated before the wind, and he told of another priest who had walked on the sea as on a meadow 
and plucked flowers as he went. Hearing such tales, how could St. Brandon fear to enter on his own voyage? He caused a boat to be built of a fashion which one may still see in Welsh and Irish rivers, and known as a cura, or coracle, made of an osseo frame covered with tanned and oiled skins. He took with him seventeen priests, among whom was St. Malo, then a mere boy, but afterwards celebrated. They sailed to the southwest, and after being forty days at sea, they reached a rocky island, furrowed with streams, where they received the kindest hospitality, and took in fresh provisions. They sailed again the next day, and found themselves entangled in contrary currents and perplexing winds, so that they were long in reaching another island, green and fertile, watered by rivers which were full of fish, and covered with vast herds of sheep as large as heifers. Here they renewed their stock of provisions and chose a spotless lamb with which to celebrate Easter Sunday on another island, which they saw at a short distance. This island was wholly bare, without sandy shores or wooded slopes, and they all landed upon it to cook their lamb. But when they had arranged their cooking apparatus, and when their fire began to blaze, the island seemed to move beneath their feet, and they ran in terror to their boat, from which Brandon had not yet landed. Their supposed island was a whale, and they rowed hastily away from it toward the island they had left, while the whale glided away, still showing at a distance of two miles the fire blazing on his back. The next island they visited was wooded and fertile, where they found a multitude of birds, which chanted with them the praises of the Lord, so that they called this the Paradise of Birds. This was the description given of this island by an old writer named Winkin de Word in The Golden Legend. Soon after, as God would, they saw a fair island, full of flowers, herbs, and trees, whereof they thanked God of his good grace and anon they went on land, and when they had gone long in this, they found a full fair well, and thereby stood a fair tree full of bows, and on every bow sat a fair bird, and they sat so thick on the tree that uneath scarcely any leaf of the tree might be seen. The number of them was so great, and they sang so merrily, that it was an heavenly noise to hear whereupon St. Brendan kneeled down on his knees and wept for joy, and made his praise devoutly to our Lord God, to know what these birds meant. And then anon one of the birds flew from the tree to St. Brendan, and he with the flickering of his wings made a full merry noise like a fiddle, that him seemed he never heard so joyful a melody and then St. Brandon commanded the fowl to tell him the cause why they sat so thick on the tree and sang so merrily. And then the fowl said, Sometime we were angels in heaven. But when our master Lucifer fell down into hell for his high pride, and we fell with him for our offenses, some higher and some lower, after the quality of the trespass, and because our trespass is so little, therefore our Lord hath sent us here, out of all pain, in full great joy and mirth, after his pleasing, here to serve him on this tree in the best manner we can. The Sunday is a day of rest from all worldly occupation, and therefore that day all we be made as white as any snow, for to praise our Lord in the best wise we may. And then all the birds began to sing even songs so merrily that it was an heavenly noise to hear. And after supper, St. Brandon and his fellows went to bed and slept well. And in the morn they arose by times. And then those fowls began matins, prime, and hours, and all such service as Christian men used to sing. And St. Brandon with his fellows abode there seven weeks until Trinity Sunday was passed. Having then embarked, 
they wandered for months on the ocean before reaching another island that on which they finally landed was inhabited by monks who had as their patrons saint patrick and saint aylby and they spent christmas there a year passed in these voyages and the tradition is that for six other years they made just the same circuit always spending holy week at the island where they found the sheep alighting for easter on the back of the same patient whale visiting the isle of birds at pentecost and reaching the island of st patrick and st aylby in time for christmas but in the seventh year they met with wholly new perils they were attacked the legend says first by a whale then by a griffin and then by a race of cyclops or one-eyed giants then they came to an island where the whale which had attacked them was thrown on shore so that they could cut him to pieces then another island which had great fruits and was called the island of the strong man and lastly one where the grapes filled the air with perfume after this they saw an island all cinders and flames where the cyclops had their forges and they sailed away in the light of an immense fire the next day they saw looking northward a great and high mountain sending out flames at the top turning hastily from this dreadful sight they saw a little round island at the top of which a hermit dwelt who gave them his benediction then they sailed southward once more and stopped at their usual places of resort for holy week easter and whitsuntide it was on this trip that they had so the legend says that strange interview with judas iscariot out of which matthew arnold has made a ballad sailing in the wintry northern seas at christmas time st brandon saw an iceberg floating by on which a human form rested motionless and when it moved at last he saw by its resemblance to the painted pictures he had seen that it must be judas iscariot who had died five centuries before then as the boat floated near the iceberg judas spoke and told him his tale after he had betrayed jesus christ after he had died and had been consigned to the flames of hell which were believed in very literally in those days an angel came to him on christmas night and said that he might go thence and cool himself for an hour why this mercy asked judas iscariot then the angel said to him remember the leper in joppa and poor judas recalled how once when the hot wind called the sirocco swept through the streets of joppa and he saw a naked leper by the wayside sitting in agony from the heat and the drifting sand judas had thrown his cloak over him for a shelter and received his thanks in reward for this the angel now told him he was to have once a year an hour's respite from his pain he was allowed in that hour to fling himself on an iceberg and cool his burning heat as he drifted through the northern seas then saint brandon bent his head in prayer and when he looked up the hour was past and judas had been hurried back into his torments it seems to have been only after seven years of this wandering that they at last penetrated within the obscure fogs which surrounded the isle of the saints and came upon a shore which lay all bathed in sunny light it was a vast island sprinkled with precious stones and covered with ripe fruits they traversed it for forty days without arriving at the end though they reached a great river which flowed through the midst of it from east to west there an angel appeared to them and told them that they could go no farther but could return to their own abode carrying from the island some of those fruits and precious stones which were reserved to be distributed among the saints when all the world should be brought to the true faith in order to hasten that time it appears that saint malo the youngest of the seafaring monks had wished in his zeal to baptize someone and had therefore dug up a heathen giant who had been for some reason buried on the blessed isle not only had he dug the giant's body up but saint malo had brought him to life again sufficiently for the purpose of baptism and instruction in the true faith after which he gave him the name of mildus 
and let him die once more and be reburied. Then facing homeward and sailing beyond the fog, they touched once more at the Island of Delights, received the benediction of the abbot of the monastery, and sailed for Ireland to tell their brethren of the wonders they had seen. He used to tell them especially to his nurse, Ita, under whose care he had been placed until his fifth year. His monastery at Clonfort grew, as has been said, to include 3,000 monks, and he spent his remaining years in peace and sanctity. The supposed islands which he visited are still believed by many to have formed a part of the American continent, and he is still thought by some Irish scholars to have been the first to discover this hemisphere, nearly a thousand years before Columbus, although this view has not yet made much impression on historians. The paradise of birds, in particular, has been placed by these scholars in Mexico, and an Irish poet has written a long poem describing the delights to be found there. Oft in the sunny mornings have I seen bright yellow birds of a rich lemon hue, meeting in crowds upon the branches green, and sweetly singing all the morning through, and others with their heads grayish and dark, pressing their cinnamon cheeks to the old trees, and striking on the hard, rough, shriveled bark like conscience on a bosom ill at ease, and diamond birds chirping their single notes, now mid the trumpet flowers deep blossom seen, now floating brightly on with fiery throats, small winged emeralds of golden green, and other larger birds with orange cheeks, a many-colored painted chattering crowd, prattling forever with their curved beaks, and through the silent woods screaming aloud. End of chapter 12